Well, welcome everybody, and thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you for joining this listening forum that we've put together. I'm really honored to play a small part and mostly to be here to learn from each of you. I do have just a few introductory comments, if I may, and one is to just emphasize that this is a very important time for all of us. How we continue to address racism in our communities can and will dictate much of our future, not just as a academic medical center, but for all of the cities and towns that we have, for the state that we serve, for the nation and for the world. The dialogue that we have today, even though it's via remote medium, uh, is another important step moving forward. I want you to know that we view and internalize all of the comments that you submit by the chat box and from the breakout sessions as part of the ongoing dialogue that makes this so important to us. These comments and your input will not only guide our discussion today, but will guide our path forward over the next few weeks and well into the future and help to create my own personal homework list of things that are important to me to continue to address the racisms that challenge our communities, challenge academic medicine, and challenge our nation. This dialogue, our dialogue, must continue, and with the leadership of UNMC being committed to not only listening, but to acting. We're committed to making change. We know that we must ultimately be judged by our actions and not simply by our words. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce to you once more Dr. Sharita Strong. As we've said before, Dr. Strong is not only a member of our psychiatry faculty, but also serves as the Director of Inclusion here at UNMC. In less than a year in this position, Dr. Strong has led significant steps in addressing inclusion, diversity, and equity at UNMC, and is an important part of our leadership team. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Sharita Strong. Thank you, Dr. Goat, for that introduction and for those thoughtful words. I have a few additional opening remarks, then I will introduce our well-regarded facilitators who will further set the stage for the activity today. As the Director of Inclusion, I am very excited to be a part of these much needed conversations. I am elated that our esteemed panelists said yes to being a part of this activity. It takes courage and vulnerability to serve in this capacity. Last time we were together in this setting, there was a sense of urgency after we witnessed another black man, George Floyd, get murdered over and over and over on the news. There have been so many others around the country, but within our own community, we also have images in our minds of Zachary Bear Hills, a man from the Native American community who also died at the hands of law enforcement. The urgency is still upon us, and we must be strategic and methodical about our next steps as we need sustainable change on our campus and our surrounding communities. As a campus, there have been department diversity groups forming. We have an associate dean for diversity and inclusion in the College of Allied Health Professions, Jan Tompkins, and we are in the process of finding an ideal candidate for the College of Medicine's Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion from some amazing candidates. The other colleges are also considering following suit. We have connected with the Omaha Chamber of Commerce regarding the commitment to opportunity, diversity, and equity, and, and we've connected with inclusive communities, which are both local and we've connected with a few national firms such as Visions Incorporated. Having an objective eye outside of UNMC to assist us with carrying out a thoughtful plan is very important to our future progress. Internally, I'm so encouraged by our students who are elevating their voices. They have also participated in the White Coats for Black Lives with faculty and staff and maybe forming a group here. The Office of Inclusion, the Office of Equity, and the Student Recruitment and Engagement Office are planning safe spaces on campus for students and other members of our campus uh, community. Stay tuned. As we embark on more difficult conversations, remember this is only the beginning. These must be handled with care. 
because there can be tremendous growth on the other side of a difficult conversation. Thank you everyone for bringing your voices, your hearts, and your minds to this conversation. We are listening, we hear you. The leaders on campus are engaging in discussions regarding how to make their units more inclusive. What's the point of being on a team if you never get to play or if you never get to practice? Those same leaders want your input and your feedback. They want to be held accountable and are interested in making these changes as they understand that we all have the work, this work to do together to move the needle. And we need our allies to continue stepping forward as your voices are loud when you support the efforts and even louder when you do not. If you didn't know this, your silence is deafening. Like the late representative John Lewis stated, if you see something that is not right, not just, you have a moral obligation to do something about it. Lastly, I also want to say, don't lose the urgency. Don't go back to the day before George Floyd was murdered. Don't lose the motivation and momentum to move this campus forward. Thank you again for your presence today and for being a part of the solution. I will now introduce our facilitators. Serena Dacus and Katie Brandard will be facilitating the panel and discussion during today's forum. Serena and Katie are both illustrious alumni of the College of Public Health, and Katie currently serves as the Manager of Workforce Development and Leadership Programs in the Office of Public Health Practice. Both are known facilitators in our region around difficult conversations, culture work, and organizational strategies strategy. Serena and Katie. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gold and Dr. Strong for that very warm welcome and for setting the context for our time today. On behalf of Katie and I, we would like to welcome you to this conversation. We are honored to be here to support this forum and to allow some additional opportunities for discussion around diversity and inclusion. So the remainder of our time together today, you will have many opportunities to hear voices from across UNMC, uh, from your friends, from your colleagues, as well as the opportunity to engage in some discussion. It was heard loud and clear at a forum, the feedback from the last forum, that opportunities to not only hear from others, but also opportunities for others to share their, their connections and their experiences across campus as well. So we will start today with a panel discussion and the chance for you to hear some of the experiences with diversity inclusion from our esteemed panelists, who Katie will introduce in just a moment. And then we are actually going to spend some time in Zoom breakout rooms in small group discussions, where you will get the opportunity to engage with other students, faculty and staff from across the campus in what we hope will be very meaningful and valuable ways. And we know this is just the beginning, right? We're just at the beginning of this journey that many of us have been on across our lifetime, but we're at the beginning of it together as a UNMC campus. A lot of, of things have already been done, um, but we know that the, the conversation and discussion will continue and move beyond today. So as we begin the panel, we've prepared two questions for each panelist that they will have the opportunity to answer. And then we will create time in the breakout rooms for some additional discussions. We will take all questions that are from the audience from today's panel, and we will ask you that you write those if you have them into the comment box. We will not be answering additional questions for the panelists specifically today, but we will take all comments and questions, conversation that's entered into the chat box into consideration for future sessions and responses will be provided as appropriate. So at this time, Katie is going to actually include a link in the chat box to the questions and answers from the first forum. So if you didn't have an opportunity to see in UNMC today, the link that's being shared, these are all of the questions that were submitted from the previous forum that were then responded to um, by our UNMC community. So at this time, I'll actually turn it over to Katie to introduce our panelists. Thanks so much, Serena. So please join me everyone in welcoming our three panelists for today. 
Shaker Dukapati is an MD, M MD PhD student in the College of Medicine and Monroe Meyer Institute. He is the Student Senate Representative and he's a co-founder and a chair for the Student Alliance for People of All Abilities. We welcome you, Shaker. Second is Lisa Spellman. She's a Publications and Media Specialist in the Department of Strategic Communication at UNMC and an enrolled member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe of South Dakota. Thanks, Lisa, for joining us today. And our third panelist today is Emily McElroy. Emily is an Associate Professor and Dean of the McGugan Health Sciences Library. Emily is one of the founding members of the LGBTQ Employee Alliance. We are so thankful that all three of you were willing to join us for this uh, panel discussion this, uh, this morning and this afternoon. So first, I'd like to ask each panelist to more fully introduce yourself and then to share at least one experience from your life when you were aware of your identity, your culture, your race, and what created that awareness for you. So one experience from your life when you were aware of your identity, culture, or race, and what created that experience for you. And Emily, I'm gonna ask you to start. Thanks, Katie. Um, right before I started my graduate program in library and information science, I um, came out to my friends and family. And while I was finishing up my graduate program, I worked at an academic library in Chicago. I was not out at work. I talked about a roommate, but I think a lot of us have had roommates in their 20s, so it didn't seem that unusual to, to make those comments. But during my two and a half years of working there, I went through a physically and emotionally hostile experience from a coworker. And I had no idea why this coworker was treating me this way until one day I learned that it was because of my sexual orientation. One day she threatened the lives of everyone who worked in the department who was gay by saying her boyfriend would come and shoot all of us. And the situation dragged out for nearly six months with multiple physical threats. And while it was a personally just devastating situation for me, I learned a lot about myself, the institutional structures set up that can either harm or help us and how being myself was not always going to be easy. I was lucky in that I had coworkers who stood by my side and the university special assistant to the president who advised me on all of my next steps. But despite that, it was, it was a very isolating experience. I had always been very involved in social justice movements and lived in communities that I served. I considered myself strong and someone who would stand up for others and myself, even if it meant a risk to my family or to a loss of friends. But this experience was different and affected everything about me. Um, I was lucky that I lived in Chicago and Cook County, so I was protected as a member of the LGBT community. If I had lived one county over, I would not have been protected at all. So until the recent Supreme Court case last month, and say I had the same situation here in Nebraska, I wouldn't have been protected if I lived outside of Omaha. So while I support and celebrate marriage rights, protection and employment and housing has always been more important to me based on my experience. While society is now more accepting of LGBTQ individuals than 21 years ago, I'm still very cautious uh, based on my experience throughout my career, especially as a junior faculty member, I've been very careful about coming out at work, even when I've lived in very progressive cities or worked in libraries that were very welcoming and even worked for very open and out LGBTQ bosses of mine. I'm obviously out now, otherwise I, I wouldn't be on the panel today, but I also had to carefully consider if I wanted to be this out to campus um, rather than carefully choosing who I tell and the type of situation I'm in. And doing this makes me feel actually more vulnerable than I think I've, I have felt in, in 21 years. Um, I tend to usually keep to myself until something happens and I feel I need to speak up. While some would say it shouldn't matter what other people think, I, I think it does matter, especially in a professional setting. At times I struggle and think that I'm not my authentic self at work. I leave out gaps in my life um, that most people openly share in the workplace. As I, I tell people um, over and over, you don't just come out once in your life. 
every person who becomes a close colleague or friend you involve come, involves coming out. There's always a risk that a person will respond in a negative way and affect our relationship, um, whether it's a working relationship or a personal relationship moving forward. And while I know I have scars that make it more difficult for me, I know I'm not alone. I recognize that I have privilege um, compared to other LGBTQ individuals in that I'm in a leadership position where I can affect change. I am white, I am not transgender. As one example, transgender women of color have a life expectancy of 30 to 35 years of age. Let me just say that again, 30 to 35 years of age. And so it is easier for me to advocate for changes when I think um, LGBTQ individuals may not feel welcome. I try and use my voice because I know that depression and suicide rates are high in the LGBT community. And as a leader here at UNMC, I know that we need to consistently show up, um, recognize our students and keep the conversations going. Thank you so much, Emily. Lisa, our first question to you. Share one experience from your life when you were aware of your identity, culture or race and what created that awareness. Lisa, you are muted and I'm gonna yep. unmute you and ask you to restart. Yeah, I didn't know if I need, we needed to unmute ourselves. Sorry about that. Thank you again for allowing me to um, be a part of this panel today. Emily, thank you for being so vulnerable and sharing your experience. Um, I agree with you in that it makes you feel that much more vulnerable as a person to talk about yourself personally. I have um, shared experiences of my personal culture, but in a very different way um, with students at Creighton University for um, more than 12 years now. And I'm always talking outside of my own perspective, outside of myself. Um, but I always introduce myself as Lisa Prue because Prue is my maiden name and it identifies who I am in relation to my family on Rosebud. And I'm a member of the Sikanju Oyate who reside on the Rosebud Indian Reservation. That is how we identify ourselves as a tribal peoples. That is the name of our, of our tribe. Um, and what I, would, what I would like to share um, with you guys today is that I know whose shoulders I stand on. I know the people who came before me and how they had to navigate life and the difficulties that they face and I tell my children, you stand on those shoulders too. Um, you stand on the shoulders of your great-great-grandmother, Nancy Little Money, of Grandpa Joe, Grandpa Webster Two Hawk, um, who at the age of 90, recently last year, stepped down from our tribal council. He's a, a very holy, holy man, um, believes greatly in the strength of the Oyate, of the people, and when I'm with my family, I always know who I am. They always recognize me for who I am. And I never had any doubt about that until I became, you know, in my adolescent years, my early teenage years and began meeting other people and talking about who I was. And one of the very first things that people would say to me is, well, you don't look Indian. Um, do you, did you grow up on a reservation? Do you live on the reservation? Do you speak the language? Um, those kinds of things are pretty painful because Native American people in this country, indigenous people in this country have a very unique relationship with the United States in that we were forced, our families were forced to live outside of where they normally would have liked to have lived. Some were moved from homelands to other parts of the country. People were forced to live on reservations and What's interesting is I can look in a um, particular book uh, that I found um, on a visit to Mount Rushmore, of all places, that showed the Prue name and our allotment because during the Dawes Act, um, in one of the United States government's numerous attempts to deal with their Indian problem, um, they allotted on our reservation, checkerboarding our reservation, allotted different lands. And so these experiences that my family um, have and continue to have, have impacted 
my life and my children's lives. Um, I have uh, friends who um, are particularly uh, well-versed in historic trauma and talk about historic trauma. And I never thought about that. I never thought about, well, how does that really, how did, you know, something that happened so long ago, how does that really impact me today? But as I've gotten older and realized as some of our elders have, have left us and left this world, um, I realized that, you know, the impact of historic trauma on myself today, because I, I, I don't speak the language, I, I speak very few of the, of the actual Lakota words, um, and the people that I have to rely on um, that are gone, that did speak the language, that t could tell me about my culture and could tell me about my family and my family's different roles in that culture and the impact that that had on me um, is gone. So historic trauma on for me and for my children is a legacy that we, we live with. But we are trying to learn as much as we can. We do participate in ceremonies. We do visit our family, again, where we feel the most comfortable when we're around our family. And we know that through those encounters and everything, we know that we aren't defined by the way other people view Native Americans or the way that people have tried to define me. Well, are you, you know, what's your blood quantum? Um, what do you look like? Those kinds of things. I have green eyes. I don't have dark brown eyes. Um, I have lighter skin, um, whereas my brother has more of the typical features of, of natives. And so I have learned now, finally, at the age of 49, that I do not let other people define me and define my identity. I know who I am. I know whose shoulders I stand on. And I know how important it is to pass that legacy onto my children and instill a sense of identity in them because so often our children of color are defined outside of who they are really are and that impacts them for a lifetime when somebody tells them who they think they are rather than them growing up with that and learning that like we all naturally do. So um, again, I just, I know whose shoulders I stand on and I, I, I think people like Nancy Little Money, my great grandmother, uh, my grandfather Webster Tuhawk, um, Amos Prue, and um, very dear friend Frank Lemire for all of their wisdom and for bringing me to where I am today. Thank you. Lisa, thank you so much for sharing that small piece of your story with me. And our third panelist. Uh, Shaker, I'm going to ask you the same question. Can you share with us an experience from your life when you were aware of your identity, your culture, or race, and what created that awareness for you? Sure. Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank all the organizers, um, everyone uh, that's put this in the previous sessions and the future sessions that are going to happen together. Um, I also want to thank the other panelists. Um, it takes real courage to be able to kind of speak to even a small crowd, but obviously we have a large uh, community joining us today. Um, and then I also want to thank all the attenders uh, that are here. Um, we're very glad that you're able to attend and participate and uh, learn more about each other. Um, I think that speaks a lot to who you are um, and what you're trying to do here. So in response to this question, you know, I've been, I've been thinking about uh, various, um, you know, various parts of my, what I consider to be my identity. Um, and I thought about two small experiences um, that I thought I would share um, that uh, came to my attention. Um, the first, um, you know, uh, to some of you that don't know me, um, I, I was born in South India. Um, I lived there uh, for a few years as a child, um, and um, I'm, uh, I have a sister um, who uh, actually has uh, epilepsy and cerebral palsy, um, and she's two years older than me, um, and we, we came to the United States, so I, I'm an immigrant uh, to this country, and we came here uh, to provide a better way of life for her, um, and that was the, that's the sole reason why I'm here uh, talking to you all today. Um, and so um, for me, uh, 
being um, a brother um, and, and being around someone um, who was different than I was, um, who had a condition um, which afforded her, uh, you know, not the same kind of life that I had, um, being able to uh, kind of look at her every time and, and ask the question like, you know, why, why is society, uh, you know, created in a certain way for, for me, uh, but not the same way for her. Um, and the very fact that, you know, we had to leave our country, uh, you know, because uh, as, as much as uh, we still have a long way to go uh, in this country um, to make life better for those with disabilities, uh, in other countries around the world, it's a lot worse. Um, and, uh, and, and where I'm from, uh, the same kind of uh, things that we take for granted here um, are, are, not, uh, are not there. Um, so that, that's one thing I wanted to share. And then the other thing I wanted to share, um, you know, so I, so I grew up um, in the woods of uh, East Texas. Um, and that's, uh, that's where I would call my, uh, or at least one of my hometowns, uh, Longview, Texas. Um, and I went to elementary school and middle school uh, with a, what I would call a very um, racially heterogeneous population. Um, but I, uh, you know, there weren't that many uh, uh, people of uh, Asian or uh, East Indian ethnicity. Um, but um, I never really was aware uh, of race um, or, uh, you know, being uh, quote unquote different um, until 9-11, uh, right? So 9-11, uh, uh, 2001, um, and then the the Iraq War afterwards, um, you know, those really, um, for, for, for someone like me, I was uh, in elementary school, or I was in middle school at the time, um, and all of a sudden, um, you know, I, I remember uh, being told for the first time to go back to my country, uh, and that was, you know, that's the first of many, 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 many uh, times uh, that I can remember uh, just um, and, and from um, and, and I, I want to say that those comments uh, came from people of all backgrounds um, and people of all um, uh, kind of and, and obviously these are mostly all uh, kids um, but uh, just I remember those times I remember uh, the the bombing jokes and, and all all of all of the inappropriate types of comments that um, I never really uh, understood, uh, you know, fully, um, and I kind of still don't understand fully to this day. Um, but I think it's interesting because I think that was something that really uh, kind of made me realize that uh, you know there, there's there's something uh, out there uh, that makes people. Um, make those comments or something out there that uh, kind of divides us. Um, and, and there are multiple things out there that divide us. Um, but that, I would say that was the first time that I was aware, aware of, um, you know, the, the, the color of my skin and, and, and my background um, and where, where I'm from, so. Thank you so much, Shaker, and thanks all of you for sharing such vulnerable pieces of yourselves and having so much courage uh, in, front of, in front of us today and, and with us today. I have a second question for each of you, and this time I'm gonna, I'm gonna go backwards. <laughs> so Shaker, you're up first. Can you describe barriers that exist at UNMC that you see clearly and how these might be overcome to create a more inclusive community here for us? Yeah, sure. Um, I, I think um, I approach everything from a student perspective. Um, so uh, from, a, from a student point of view, um, it's interesting, right? Because I think that one of the biggest barriers um, that I see is uh, very easy to describe, but hard to uh, think about and overcome. And I think, I think, I think it's really if you can boil it down to uh, a very small uh, thought, I think it's the idea that uh, we really need to stop and take time to uh, listen to each other, right? Um, 
we're all very busy, um, especially in uh, a very uh, active campus uh, and with people of all backgrounds, of all kinds of different interests. Um, people are very, very, um, uh, what's the word? Everybody has so much potential um, and everybody's working um, on, on various things. And I think that sometimes it becomes hard for us to uh, stop and kind of listen to each other um, and listen to people uh, regardless of who they are, regardless of whether they're in a, a position of power or not. Um, but, you know, regardless of whether they are in a position of privilege or not. Um, I, I noticed that somebody in one of the comments uh, said that they came to this uh, uh, the, today's uh, session because they wanted to learn uh, about others and about each other. Uh, that's a, what a wonderful thought, right? Like, you know, we want to learn about our community. Um, that, I mean, if you, if you can take nothing else, I think that's a starting point. Um, and the, the other thing that goes with that is that, um, you know, I don't think that uh, it's easy to uh, really provide or get to an inclusive community um, without trust. And that trust isn't something we build in a day. It's not something that's going to, um, you know, be uh, immediately provided, but that trust is built on, you know, people listening to each other and taking the time uh, to learn about and listen. Because I think, and, and some of the things that um, some of the other panels shared and I've shared, um, I think a lot of it is based on ignorance. Um, and so ignorance, what's the easiest way to defeat ignorance? It's, it's being able to, to learn to teach, uh, to, to destroy that ignorance, uh, you know, with knowledge. So I would say that's, um, if I could identify a big barrier um, to overcome, that's the, uh, that's where I would point my finger. And there's so many other things uh, to, to think about. Um, and I think one thing I do want to say, and I want to give a shout out to all the students out there, because I think I'm surrounded by so many um, courageous, uh, powerful um, and very, very, uh, you know, uh, effective student leaders uh, who on a daily basis are um, working at various aspects of making UNMC more inclusive. And, and I think that they need to be heard and they need to be uh, uh, put on a spotlight uh, in the future. Thank you so much. I couldn't agree with you more about the students. I've had the opportunity to watch our College of Public Health students recently. It's always impressive. Lisa, same question to you. Um, mm -hmm. Describe barriers that exist at UNMC that you see clearly and how they might be overcome to create a more inclusive community. Sure, thank you. Um, you know, I think it's important to note that it's no uh, mistake or coincidence that we are all here today having this discussion. For whatever reason, everybody who signed on, everybody who's listening, um, there are no coincidences. There's a reason that we're all having this discussion today and that we're all part of this conversation. And so that's really important to note. Um, and I think that one of the things I would like to note is that you know, I've seen a lot of really um, long-lasting um, programs for Native Americans, for children in particular, the SEPA program, the YES program. Um, they've done some really incredible things uh, through those programs, and I'm really happy to see that. Yet they're kind of disparate, and, and it's kind of hit or miss. Like, there's this program, and then, then there's this other one that pops up or there's this idea or that idea. And so I think that something that would really be helpful, and I know that um, the College of Public Health is, is trying to work on this, is kind of bringing those all together so that there's a little more strength in numbers. And the reason I bring that up is because oftentimes um, being the minority of the minority, uh, there aren't a lot of Native people at UNMC. Um, some really close friends that I have um, and people who know me will know who that is because literally I can count on one hand how many Native people are at UNMC, Native American people, Indigenous to this country. And so, um, and those people are 
literally not living in this state anymore. Um, they're part of UNMC, but they've moved. And, and that does have an impact. That has an impact on me as a Native person to be able to have colleagues to go and talk to and to have conversation with um, and to collaborate with um, it makes it a little bit more difficult. And so having voices at the table like you are today, which I appreciate that opportunity to, to be at the table today, um, having those voices at the table brings in a different perspective, brings in a perspective that people may not have uh, thought of, um, and also helps maybe some of those people that are recruited uh, to be retained and to stay. Um, I think over the last five years, the three Native people that I knew well all left um, and literally left the state, which kind of breaks my heart <laughs> um, a little bit. So it, it makes it a little more difficult. And, and so I don't know, uh, um, you know, so much that's a bias. I just see that as a challenge um, for the university. You know, when we talk about recruiting and retaining people, um, and in particular Native people, because let's be honest, there's not a lot of us left, <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, we make up less than 2% than of the population of the United States. Um, and so having, having those colleagues on campus, physically on campus, being able to have conversations with them, um, and, and for them to feel like they have the support they need, not just as a Native person, but also as a professional, um, I've had, uh, just in my department, I've been very, very fortunate um, without question to have unwavering support, but um, I witnessed colleagues who didn't have that or felt that kind of support, um, and, and that's heartbreaking because there are incredible programs that with, with support do really, really well. And, and just blossom and grow. And um, I really hold the SEPA program up as, as an incredible program that just blossomed. Um, but also it's because of the passion and drive of the people behind those programs. Um, another thing I would, would say is, you know, because there are so few um, people with, with maybe my particular background, um, we have a big passion for for what we do, we have a big passion for what we become involved in, but then at the same time, you do get pulled in a lot of directions because there isn't a lot of people to go to to ask, hey, your opinion on this, hey, can you help with this, can you help with that, and um, I'm always, always happy to do so. Um, I realized um, one day, one morning I woke up and I was like, I'm the elder. <laughs> I have to use my voice and I'm happy to be a part of that conversation and to always be um, consulted or, or happy to give whatever advice. And if I don't know the answer, I'm going to try to help you find the answer. Um, but it does put a strain on your day to day um, because you do have a passion and you do want to respond and you do want to be involved. But at the same time, you have a life, you have a job, I have a job, you know, I have a family. And so it's, it's a balancing act. Um, again, it's not an obstacle, it's a challenge, and um, it's something that you figure out. Um, I'm very passionate about the, the opportunities that I've had in being able to work with different colleagues on campus, and so that's a plus, but at the same time, it's kind of disparaged, kind of all over the map. So we really need to try to pull this together and, again, have voices at the table, and in particular, from I can only speak from my own perspective, having made a voice at the table, um, an indigenous person of this, to this continent, to be able to speak, and I can only speak for, um, as, a, as a Lakota person, um, I can't speak for the other more than 500 nations that occupy um, these lands. Um, so, again, if I don't have the answer, I can go look for you or, or do my best to try to connect you with somebody that has the answer. But just having the opportunity to be at the table is huge. Like Shaker was saying, you know, going out and, and trying to um, find out from people of all different backgrounds and, and getting those um, voices heard is super important. So I think um, something that UNMC could definitely um, you know, just keep that in the back of your mind. And, and it doesn't have to be, you know, I, I try to look for solutions 
So, you know, we can complain all day. People can get mad about things all day. But that doesn't lend to good conversation. It doesn't draw conversation, and it doesn't lead to solutions. So what we're doing today makes me happy because I feel like we're able to have conversation. We're able to, to come up together with solutions, and things don't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be earth-shattering. It doesn't have to be groundbreaking. Um, it can be something as simple as making sure that before you make assumption that you talk with somebody or going and looking for somebody of that particular group, no matter what group it is, um, and, and going to, to hear their voices can, can again, like you said, the whole conversations lead to growth, but those conversations lead to a lot of growth. So, thank you. Thanks so much, Lisa. Um, and Emily, final question for you. Will you describe barriers that exist at UNMC that you see clearly and how they might be overcome to create a more inclusive community? So one of the biggest barriers has to do with language um, that we use. It's often very subtle, but it's easily noticeable to anyone in the LGBTQ community. Often the language we use in written documents and on our website is geared to straight individuals. I've been part of recruitment conversations on campus when people talk about husbands, wives, and spouses in a way that strongly assumes candidates are in straight relationships. So right there, you're automatically um, limiting the, um, the possibilities, but also those things are noticed when someone comes to campus for a campus interview. We need to ensure that our recruitment language removes that assumption. Um, we also need to include LGBTQ issues and when we discuss implicit bias and discussions around language. Being gay is not a choice. Um, it's not a lifestyle, it's who we are. Um, a colleague told me yesterday about walking down the hallway um, of University Tower and hearing some people tell jokes about gay people. And the question I would ask is, we would, would we accept that language if it was for a different group? Um, but somehow it's, it's okay if it's geared towards a gay individual. Personally, one of the more frustrating and embarrassing common occurrences on campus for me is when I go into the cafeteria or go get a cup of coffee and, and someone is um, using, starting the conversation with sir or ma'am because people are easily misidentified. And it's really embarrassing if you're around other people. So I usually try and head that off by saying something um, before they can even misidentify me. Um, I think if you, I mean, yeah, I have short hair, but <laughs> you know, I hope there are other things about me that you know don't necessarily um, give someone the understanding um, that I'm, you know, different gender. Um, Last month, I spent a weekend in a small Iowa town with my sisters and their families. And this small downtown had pride flags lining the downtown. And my nephew and I immediately felt welcome and safe. He's applying to colleges and is paying close attention to how college towns and universities show support for the LGBT community. So it'd be nice to see a similar representation at UNMC. It was hard. Um, honestly, returning to Omaha from this town, because with the exception of a few companies, I didn't see any celebration of Pride Month. With the exception of my small hometown in Illinois that I grew up in, Omaha is the first city where I haven't seen civic displays of pride. And it really does make someone wonder is how does Omaha or how does being in Omaha or Nebraska feel? For me, a huge difference at UNMC is how the LGBTQ um, Employee Alliance at um, that's both UNMC and Nebraska Medicine has grown over the time that I've been here. Through a lot of education sessions, social gatherings, the Alliance offers a platform where people can get together and celebrate and also build connections. So just in the, the time that I've been here, the growth at Pride, um, at Omaha's Pride Parade, or gathering together last year's and last fall's Transgender Day of Remembrance and, and just knowing that I'm not alone, um, that there are colleagues. When the colleges look at their curriculum, I hope they look at integrating cases with LGBTQ individuals, especially with many health issues affecting my population. 
there are excellent resources out there that discuss how to better care for LGBTQ patients that we should start teaching during someone's education. As someone who comes from a rural community, it is important that we teach our students the challenges that LGBTQ individuals face because it just isn't in Omaha um, where someone will encounter um, a patient like me, but also um, wherever they serve. And as I mentioned, the Employee Alliance has created an informal support system that's important. Um, gender neutral bathrooms started first at Nebraska Medicine and are now slowly being added to the UNMC campus. Nebraska Medicine has also adopted using pronouns as a standard part of the approved email signature block. I would like to see that added to UNMC. Um, last year during the Pride Parade, the growing number of allies who marched with us, um, especially my fellow leaders, it, it just makes you feel so much more welcome. But I think the most empowering thing is marching in the parade and seeing all of the march attendees cheer when they see Nebraska Medicine and UNMC. It makes you feel very proud to be part of the UNMC community. Living in Omaha, Nebraska is challenging if you are LGBTQ. I know it has affected my well-being at times, but UNMC can play an important role in lifting us within the community and making us feel welcome here. I've certainly seen the strong support from Chancellor Gold, um, Dr. Deli Davies, who I report to, and now with um, Dr. Strong. I, I just feel that things will continue improving, but we really do need to gather the resources that are there for the community and, and start looking at what we're teaching our students. Thank you so much, Emily. And I just want to um, say to Emily, Lisa, and Shaker, if you were nervous about your vulnerability coming into today's panel, read the chat box because people were so thankful, are so thankful for everything um, that you shared. And I too wanna uh, express my appreciation to the three of you for um, showing up today in the way you did. It was greatly appreciated and it will help our community grow in ways um, that maybe you won't even recognize at first. So thank you so much for your time as our panelists today. Serena. Yes, as Katie mentioned, thank you everyone for your very kind and encouraging words of our panelists. And also to those who shared what brought you to the call. It really is a valuable experience for all of us to learn what perspectives um, everyone is bringing as we start this conversation and move you into your more in-depth and more intimate conversations with our breakout rooms. So now is the opportunity where you will get the chance to share a little bit about your work around diversity and inclusion and what you've been doing both in your personal life as well as around campus, as well as share your ideas for what the UNMC campus should be working on together as we move into the future. So in just a few moments, we are going to transition to Zoom breakout rooms. If you have never experienced it before, it's kind of like a Star Trek virtual <laughs> transformation. You're going to swish into a breakout room where you'll be with a smaller group of people, um, probably around five to six people or so for about a 20 minute conversation. We have two questions that we are going to pose for the breakout rooms. We'll have these in the chat box so you don't have to write them down. But the two questions, just to give you all a heads up, what steps, big or small, have you taken to address inequities, racism, and privilege in the last three months? And then the next question, what is one step you look to UNMC to take to address isms on campus? So those are the two questions that we'll have you all take the opportunity to answer when you go into your breakout rooms. Um, because we're going into breakout rooms with folks that you may potentially not know, you'll um, have the opportunity to get to know them a little bit through our conversation, but we also wanted to offer some conversation guidelines that have been created by a nonprofit consulting firm out of North Carolina called Visions that Dr. Strong actually mentioned in her introduction. So Katie has shared those conversation guidelines for effective cross-cultural dialogue on your screen. And we won't read through all of them, but there are a couple that we really like to highlight. And those two are going to be the two in bold. So try on, and what we mean by try on is 
we know that each of us brings very unique and different experiences. So you may have heard something already that feels different from your own experience, and you will likely hear something within your breakout group that might be different from your own experience. We just ask that you try that on. It's gonna feel different, it's gonna look different, but we ask that you try on those experiences that are different from your own. The second that we'd like to share as we move into the breakouts is the practicing of both and thinking. So for example, my life experiences are different than Katie's life experiences. However, we both have two truths that we live in. So two truths can exist at the same time. And so just thinking about that as we enter into that conversation, that both things and both experiences and both realities may in fact be true, even if they're different from our own. So you'll have about 20 minutes for your group's discussion, and we will re-enter our main session at 1240. So we would like you to take the time to have the conversation, give everyone a chance to speak as long as they are willing to and able to. I hope that and encourage you to also share your video if you're willing and able to as well. So you can have the opportunity to get to know those folks at least virtually face-to-face -face that are in your group. And um, when you are done, we will be asking you to share one of the key highlights back in the chat box when we return. So if you want to designate a scribe who would be willing to either take notes or be that individual who will share back in the chat box when we're finished, that would be great. So if you have any questions at any time while you're in the breakout rooms, there's a button at the bottom that can that says leave room. You can leave the room, ask Katie and I the question, and then we can we can transfer you back into the breakout room. So don't forget to take yourselves off mute. That's another important key point once you get in the breakout room. But Katie, how are we doing? Do you have everybody assigned to the group? I just did. Yes, we're ready to go, um, everyone. So again, I'll, I'll place those um, questions in the chat box one more time for you so that you have access to them as you go into the breakout rooms. What steps, big or small, have you taken to address inequities in race, uh, racism and privilege in the last three months? And what's one step you look to UNMC to address? Uh, to do to address these issues on our campus. And we will ask one person from your breakout to scribe that into the chat box, uh, your, the answer to the second question upon your return. So I'm going to open all rooms and we'll see you again in about, uh, with our time remaining, about 15 minutes. All right, Dr. Gold, all of the breakout rooms have returned. So while you uh, listen to Dr. Gold give his closing remarks, please don't forget to have one person from each breakout space, place your response into the chat box for that question about what you take a question on your way out the door. So be watching for that, Dr. Gold. Thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me. I'd like to start off by thanking everybody, but particularly thanking uh, Emily, uh, Lisa, and Shaker. I'd like to thank you for not only taking your time but for your courage and for inspiring us all. Uh, incredibly powerful session. And listening to you not only provides insight to me, but it reminds me that creating vulnerability is a critical part of getting to really know and appreciate each other. And what I have learned through my own leadership development over the years is that creating vulnerability, and we all have vulnerability, no matter who you are, no matter what your background is, if you dig deep enough and ask the right questions and think reflectively and not just reflexively, uh, you can find vulnerability and those vulnerabilities are critically important. So <clears throat> I like to take notes. So uh, just a brief summary of what I heard today. Uh, and I look forward to the breakout group feedback but to take time to listen, to build trust, to be sure that there are a very wide voices at the table, to understand, as we all know, that successful programs are driven by successful people, and that is the, without those successful people and inspiring people, the programs usually don't uh, succeed. We need to be wary of premature assumptions and judgments, that our choice of language is extremely important. 
we need to look carefully at our educational content to be sure that is truly reflexive. We need to gather and work with community support and then understand that no matter how many people that we may bring together, that we are not alone. So uh, I just wanna thank everybody, particularly our facilitators. And I wanna thank Dr. Strong again for uh, all that she continues to do and look forward to next time. I think this was really powerful and an incredibly good use certainly of my time. And I'm just looking at the chat boxes. It's uh, just huge as to uh, what we're getting with well over a hundred people uh, engaged here. So thank you very much for the privilege. Thank you, Dr. Gold. Thank you, Dr. Strong. And I'm entering the final chat box closing question right now, which is what topics should future forums focus on? To Dr. Gold's point, I think we'd like to do this again. And we'd love to know what uh, what would interest you and what you kinds of conversations you want to be a part of or you want to listen to. Thank you so much for attending today and take care.